Hi friends, welcome back. Um, we were talking in the previous video about where in the interstellar medium these stars tend to form. I want now to talk about um, how they actually form, what that actually looks like. Um, the cartoon version is a giant spherical ball of gas all collapsing uniformly into a single star. That is almost certainly never how it happens. Um, this next video I want to show you is a um, actual simulation that was made on a computer. So um, they simulated uh, the conditions of the interstellar medium. You've got maybe um, some um, ball of gas. This gas itself contains about 50 solar masses worth of stuff you might expect. We're going to form 50 stars. We'll see what happens. Um, anyway, they put this gas in a uniform sphere and they um, perturbed it a little bit. You can see it's not perfectly uniform. We're seeing uh, density in the color here. Low density regions are dark and red. Um, the yellow and white regions are higher density regions. Um, and so uh, at the time this was made, and it's kind of old now, maybe a decade or so old, uh, it was one of the most, um, most comprehensive simulations of any kind that had ever been done. In other words, CPU time. Took one of the fastest computers in the world um, and put all the physics in that they could, gravity and pressure and all that stuff, and um, turned on time and let it churn for about a month of processing. And, and, and this, is what, this is what came up. Um, so let's go ahead and watch this video. Um, let's see. Okay, let's watch this video and see what actually happens. So um, I'm gonna play it. And you're going to see very quickly that it does not, in fact, form a single 50 solar mass star. Much more complex and interesting things happen than that. So again, things get more dense and less dense, but it loses its spherical shape almost instantly. Um, we're going to change the scale here pretty soon when things start to happen on a large scale. But you can see near the center, things are starting to come together, and we're going to start forming stars soon. So we're going to um, let the clock we're going to zoom around and see what this thing looks like it's clearly very non-uniform now it's clearly very lumpy it's not spherical anymore that happened almost instantly um, some stars are going to start forming now you're going to see um, some these white dots are stars that are formed you can see some star some of these stars will have disks around them from which presumably planets will form um, uh, but the the very massive stars are going to tend to be drawn towards the center and they will tend to dominate everything that happens and you can see low mass stars getting flung out um, at a rather a rapid rate. Um, you can see a nice uh, disc formed around this lower right one. Um, we're going to zoom in on that one and follow it because that's where most of the action is. Um, you can see the time in the upper right. We're already at 250,000 years or so um, for this all to have taken place from the very beginning of the video. Um, but uh, you can see, um, when we get to the end of this, we're going to zoom out. This is kind of what actual star formation regions look like. We have a couple of massive stars at the center, a very unif non-uniform, messy um, part of um, interstellar space. Um, and let's go back to PowerPoint now. Um, and that's what we think real star formation regions actually look like. Not what we think. We actually can, can actually observe them. That is what they look like. Um, so we think that's a pretty good. So th the point there is, if you have a 50 solar mass cloud, it's not just going to collapse into a single 50 solar mass object. It's a very dynamic, chaotic process by which stars form. And the cartoon version is only just that a cartoon version. When we look at real star forming regions, they might look like this. Um, this is a very typical star forming region. You have a, lots of glowing gas, some baby stars up here, um, sort of in the center, uh, upper left of the central region of this um, image that have, again, just formed out of the interstellar gas. Those are very bright, some of them very massive, some of them very hot stars. Those stars have tremendous winds. Those winds blow out um, the interstellar medium and the gas from which they formed. Um, and they also cause it to heat up and glow. And so all of this region is glowing, of space is glowing, because these very bright, massive stars are there um, and, are, and are causing that gas to heat up. 
And as you know, it's an emission nebula, right? We talked about this in the light portion of our class. Um, hydrogen atoms and other atoms are being excited by these high energy photons that are coming by and then as and absorbing some photons. And then as they um, want to go back down to the ground state, they're emitting photons in other directions. And that gives you an emission nebula. And that's exactly what we're seeing here, uh, an, emission, uh, an emission nebula. Um, uh, I want to zoom in on the next slide on, these, on this particular region right here, uh, because it's one of the most famous and most impressive images that the Hubble Space Telescope ever took. Um, let's go to the next slide and I'll show you what this means. Um, but basically the next slide is just to zoom in on this particular region of this thing called the Eagle Nebula. So here it is. How about that, right? Is that not the most amazing Hubble Space Telescope image you've ever seen? Perhaps the, mo the most amazing image you've ever seen. Um, what are we looking at here? We are looking at what remains of the very hot, dense, cold molecular gas from which baby stars are forming. Um, this is very typical of star forming regions. In fact, um, you can always tell when you look at a picture like this where the actual bright, hot, uh, very massive stars are that are blowing out the regions because these are the pockets of very dense molecular clouds that are still, um, that are still there. The, the densest regions, all the other molecular gas has been um, blown away by the winds from these hot, very hot stars. And so these always, these fingers of creation, the pillars of creation always point back towards the very hot mass of stars. How do we know that? Well, why is this whole column still here? It's here because there was a very dense clump of interstellar gas right there that was shielding, kind of casting a shadow from the tremendous winds that are coming from these very hot massive stars. You can always tell where the very hot massive young stars are in a region because these fingers always point back to them. These are shadows. But the, um, the, uh, the detail in this, in this image is absolutely stunning. You can see individual nodules and pockets and, and interesting regions of, of interstellar space as it's been sculpted by this wind from the very massive stars. One of the most breathtaking images that's ever been taken of the universe, in my humble opinion. Okay, we had talked about the Orion Nebula complex. Um, this is a, an example of the Orion Nebula complex, uh, an image of it in the, infrared, in the visible light rather. You can see some very hot massive stars here. You can see, again, glowing, hot glowing gas, as we've seen from before. Um, the cool thing, though, is in the Orion Nebula, it's close enough that we can get some very cool images of baby stars that have, in fact, emerged from, their, from the nebula. You can see uh, some of them um, you've got. Um, so these are two examples over here of baby stars, actually four of them. Um, these two, one in particular, you see um, a bright central object, which is the star itself, surrounded by a dark disk of material. Um, that dark disk of material is presumably a um, protostellar disk, uh, protoplanetary disk, and we're seeing it in silhouette. So there's um, a bright uh, nebulous um, material in the background, and you're seeing this dark region of material, which is the disk that's formed around the star. This is typical what happens when stars form. Um, angular momentum prevents all of that gas and dust from, from collapsing into the star directly. Some of it instead settles onto a circumstellar disk. Um, and that disk will continue to accrete some material, but this is the disk out of which we presume planets will begin to form at some point later on in this star's life. And this one is very similar. This you can see over here, um, this red one also has a circumstellar disk but has something that's pretty common in these things also, which is when you have material falling onto a compact object in the center uh, from a disk, angular momentum says that some of that material actually gets caught up into a jet that goes in either direction. Um, and so it's not atypical to see where you have a disk of material falling onto a rapidly rotating, let's say, central object that you have these two jets pointing off in either direction. Now you can even tell in this particular case up here which direction the wind is coming from. It's coming from the top, and we can tell that because this very characteristic teardrop shape, um, and you can tell because the point at which the jet intersects with the wind, you get this very bright region where those two things slam into one another. 
And so you can sort of see, um, imagine this jet uh, being embedded in a wind that's coming from top to bottom in this particular image. Um, you can see that all happening. These are called propylids. Here's another one. You get this very characteristic teardrop shape. There's probably a jet going in this direction and that direction. And the wind is certainly going in this direction as well. Um, now your nebula is a very cool region. I want to do this quick fly through. See if I can get this going. Another YouTube video. I will pause it and maximize it. And we can hopefully share it. Oop, stop. Wait. Ah. OK. Now, let's see if I can share this. OK. It's already flying through, but that's OK. So this is the. Uh, we have enough detail on this now that we can actually place relative distances on all these objects and we can go through and you can see a three-dimensional fly through of what the Orion Nebula actually looks like and all these propylids. And you can see the teardrops, the rounded point of the teardrops always points back to these very hot massive stars at the center of this star forming complex. Um, look at that one. And you'll zoom in and can actually see that we've got a jet going um, that is going in exactly the way I just described. Circumstellar material, jet, and where that jet interacts with the winds from the massive stars, you get this cool teardrop shape. All right, that was fun. Let me go back to my PowerPoint slide. OK. So um, here's more examples of star forming regions. Again, they don't all look the same. They all look amazing in their own way. I think the one on the left here is from, one on the left here is from uh, the large Magellanic clouds, um, but doesn't really matter. You can see the characteristics. You've got the star form, the, the bright stars here in the center. You've got where there are fingers of which gas that are still remain, they all point back towards these very hot massive stars in the center. On the right here, all of the material, except for the ones at the bottom, have been cleared out completely by this, again, group of very baby, very young, massive hot stars. And you see um, this particular finger, again, pointing right back to them. Um, and this region is glowing because of all these gases, all these hot stars heating it up. OK, um, we're going to end this uh, section with uh, thinking about how these stars move on the HR diagram. How do stars approach the main sequence on the HR diagram? Obviously, by the time they get to the main sequence, um, they are like the sun and burning hydrogen and helium in the core, but they don't begin their life on the main sequence. They have to go through some stages before they get there. So last part of this class, we'll be thinking about um, how stars evolve on the main sequence from the time they're born until the time they actually reach the main sequence. So um, we have some uh, um, terms to think about here. Life track basically is how a star of a given mass seems to move on the HR diagram, meaning how it changes in luminosity, which is our y-axis coordinate, and temperature, which is our x-axis coordinate. Um, so a life track, in fact, illustrates how a star moves on the HR diagram. Um, so uh, we're going to think about all these phases in turn and how it goes from something that's extraordinarily faint and extraordinarily cold, um, in fact, off of our traditional HR diagram altogether, and, and ends up actually on the main sequence itself. Um, but I think I'll come back and do that in another video. Um, so uh, stay tuned for next time.